This is the National Programme from London. The first news, copyright reserved. And these are today's main events. Germany has invaded Poland and has bombed many towns. Okay, some of you are, are getting impatient. People are getting impatient. Mike, why don't you fire this thing up? Put some voltage on it. Let's see if the radio works. We can't just do that. We have to go through it methodically, make sure all of the capacitors are good, make sure we're not going to blow up more tubes like happened before. So we're going to take our time with the receiver. And I think in this second video we're going to get quite a bit into the actual wiring and understanding the receiver a little more so that we know what needs to be replaced and what we can leave alone and get this thing on the air without uh, any more damage to the it. The R1155 receiver represents a really a late 30s design and the heart of the receiver is really uh, uh, the, the tubes that were available at the time which had the grid caps on top. Um, you have an RF amplifier that's similar to a 6K7 a, uh, a frequency changer that has both a triode for the oscillator and a, uh, a heptode mixer. Then we go into two IF stages. Uh, both of these are AGC controlled. And then into a dual diode triode tube uh, that's used as the detector, the noise limiter, as well as the audio stage that drives the headphones. Uh, there's also a dedicated BFO uh, so that the receiver can handle CW. So it's a fairly standard receiver. Uh, once we add the 6V6, you've really got uh, uh, a very effective uh, receiver. I'm not going to talk anything about the uh, DF facilities in the receiver. That's a whole subject in itself. I won't cover that since we're not going to be using the receiver for DF. Tubes uh, are the equivalent American tubes of the uh, 6K7, the uh, 6K8, and the uh, 6Q7 uh, dual diode uh, triode. Uh, radios that are made from those tubes, especially uh, shortwave and broadcast radios of the uh, late 30s, early 40s, call those tubes the Magic 3. Those three tubes are the magic three that make up most of the receivers all the way up to about 1948-1949. It's important that you start to familiarize yourself with the layout of the receiver. And the way I'm doing that is by printing out what I can find uh, from the manual. I'm blowing it up, I'm cleaning it up, and then I'm making as nice uh, reproductions as I can. And this is helping me to locate the parts on the receiver. Before I even get close to this thing with voltages, I want to replace as many of those capacitors as I think I need to. In order to make sure that we still have good grounds. I've got a uh, 3 16 this, uh, this nut driver uh, fits beautifully and it's small enough to get in there on those small screws. And then you put a little bit of uh, deoxid on there and then you rotate and attempt to loosen and tight th tighten the nut on the, uh, on the ground lug. And what we're trying to do is make sure that our grounds are good on the sockets. Good idea to get in there. There will be a few haters that won't want to do this, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth doing before we even put any voltages on the set at all. You know, the, the 6V6 audio amplifier that was put into the uh, set had to have a cathode resistor and capacitor to set the bias. And this monstrosity represents what the uh, what they put in there this is really really something this is uh, fish paper they call it it's kind of a waxy oily paper insulator and look at this neat tying here that's been done somebody was a boy scout or something that uh, put this together this is very impressive 
let's uh, let's cut into that. This is uh, this goes well beyond ham radio into the realm of uh, artiste. Um, look at this. The insulating fish paper is coming off, and look at this beautiful uh, composite component that has been uh, put together. Now I'm anxious to see what the impedance of this might be. So let's just stick a meter across this thing. I'm curi very curious. We're getting 381 ohms. Okay, 0.38 ohms. That's excellent. That's actually a, a pretty good value for a, a 6V6 in the cathode. I'd like to see a little bit lower than that, but that's uh, that's a good value. Typically 270 ohms, but uh, 380 would work just fine. So uh, through brute force and uh, kind of a composite resistor and a 25 microfarad, 25 volt electrolytic, I'll bet this still works. Now we're going to be replacing that with this capacitor, a little bit smaller, and a single 2 watt resistor. So we've got our capacitor uh, hooked up to the uh, meter, and we're going to do a leakage test. We're measure leakage, and we're not getting any leakage. Okay, so let's take it up a little, take it up a little bit. Take it up to 30 volts. Okay, now we measure leakage. Still no leakage. Take it up to 40. And we are getting all kinds of leakage. So the capacitor has broken over around 40 volts. And it's a C26, 27, 28. And the leads coming off that capacitor are, uh, are really, really bad. They're disintegrating. So uh, my temporary fix is not going to be uh, restuffing the capacitor or doing anything that drastic. I'm going to cut it off right at the base, remove the leads, and I'm going to install some 0.1. Point ones right on the tube sockets. So this is the uh, the bias chart for the receiver. It's worth looking at the biasing and feed arrangements on the receiver. All of the uh, screen grids on the uh, on the uh, amplifier tubes and on the uh, the frequency changer, the mixer are set by two resistors, a 27K going up to the high tension and a 22K going down to, uh, to the earth ground. Uh, each of those screens takes about 1.7 milliamps at that bias level. So they have an equivalent Thevenin resistance of about 100K per tube. So when you put the 100K against the 22K in a voltage divider, with the 27K going up to uh, B+, plus, they're putting somewhere around 85 volts on those screens. Now I noticed on this receiver that uh, the, uh, the R27 is there, the 27K pull-up to B+, plus off the screen. You can see it's right here. But the, uh, they left off R28, the 22K to ground. That means there's no voltage divider and you only have the equivalent resistance of the uh, of the valve itself which is around 100K. So you're only down about 40 or 45 volts from the 220 volts. So that screen is going to have a pretty high voltage on it. So I'm going to be returning the 22K resistor to the circuit. I've got one here that I'm going to install so that we can get the bias on that particular stage back. 
I'm going to check all the other valves as well to make sure that their bias circuits are right. Okay, according to our pictorial, C37 and 38 are located right in this area. And there they are. And these caps, unlike the others, have uh, solid leads. So we really can test them for leakage. Right now I've got it set for about 100 volts. So let's go for leakage. Nothing at 100 volts. Let's take it up to 200 volts. Okay, no leakage at 200 volts. Let's bring it up to 300 volts. No leakage at 300. And we'll go as high as 350 and call it a day. Nothing at 350, so that cap is probably just fine. So we're starting to close in on uh, the capacitor replacements. So far I've replaced 12 or 13. The two triple caps used for the DF set have been stripped out. They're not used. So I don't have to worry about those. That's uh, six capacitors that uh, I'm not going to have to be concerned about. I replaced the components around the 6V6 and cleaned it up quite a bit, gotten rid of some of the the bad solder joints that were around that area. And I made special uh, I made specially sure that I got the automatic gain control capacitor changed out. Uh, the capacitor that controls that is C2, and uh, it's normally made up of 2.1 microfarad capacitors in parallel, so 0.2 microfarads. There's a uh, a grid cap wire that's going through a grommet in the chassis. It's going up to the first RF stage. Uh, this grommet is completely petrified. I mean I've got some small grommets I'm going to put in here to try to replace some of these. Okay we're finally at the part uh, that a lot of people have been waiting for with this video series and that is uh, let's start to see if we can apply power to the set to see if we can light up some filaments Let's see if the high voltage will go in without smoking something. And let's start to bring the stages up one by one. So we've got this, uh, this uh, rumor that the receiver blew up all of its valves because somebody attached power to the wrong terminals on the Jones plug. As you can see, I now have a Jones plug uh, right into the front here. This is where we're going to be applying power and doing some continuity measurements with our meter to make sure we understand what's going on. And right out of the gate we have a glaring issue. And that is that uh, you might recognize this schematic. This is the one that's published online. Which by the way agrees with the schematic and it uh, basically says that the Jones plug is uh, numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you're climbing the ladder and going side to side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But when you look at the Jones plug itself, it's not numbered that way. It's numbered just the opposite. So the plastic on the Jones plug is numbered differently than the way they decided to number the Jones plug on the receiver. Which is an error? The Jones plug or the receiver schematic? That's up to you to decide, but I would say they might have made a little boo-boo with this receiver. And uh, this could have caused uh, the smoke and the, uh, the blowing up of the valves for many people over many years. So knowing that we've got a little issue we're going to need to verify it using our meter. Okay, we have the meter set for continuity for ohms. And I'll put the beeper on. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look for is ground. We need to understand what pin ground is on. Uh, on our schematic we're looking for pin 4. So if I go to the Jones plug and find pin 4, Four, three, four, it's right here. And I go to the chassis, nothing at all. Okay, so going to pin four of the Jones plug to chassis, I have no continuity. However, if I use the numbering on the schematic and I count one, two, three, four, 
Oh my heavens, there we are. We now have continuity. The Jones plug is clearly numbering that as pin 5. So let's go to the 6.3 volt filament and we're going to check that to ground to see if we have a short. And we'll go to ground, which is the, uh, the pin right across from it, or the chassis, and it's open. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is find a valve, stick it in one of the sockets, and see if we have uh, the resistance of the valve. Okay, I've got a random valve here. This is a 6K8. And we're going to go across the, the terminals Go back to ohms, and I'm just going to put it in a socket. I don't even know what socket this is. I'll call it about 3.7 ohms. So we have continuity to that socket. Now, the next thing you want to do is plug that valve into every socket in the set and see if you get that same about 3.7 ohms resistance. That'll prove that all of the sockets are wired properly. Okay, I've gone through, I've uh, independently checked every single socket by plugging a valve into it and by measuring the continuity on these two pins. Pins 3 and 4. Uh, next we want to apply power and see if we can light up the filaments and we're going to need a filament transformer a 6.3 volt AC or DC source. I have a small filament transformer here this is about a, uh, a 2 or a 3 amp transformer. And this would be adequate probably to light the tubes in the set, temporarily at least. So I'm going to wire the output of this transformer to those two pins. And then I'm going to hook up the mains to this side. And we're going to see if we can light up the valves in the set. And that will be the first time we've proven that we're, uh, we got our filaments right. So I just uh, dimmed the lights a little bit so you can see that the tube, the valve, is indeed lit. We've attached the filament transformer right to pins 3 and 4. And I simply wire nutted on a mains cord. Okay, looking at our power supply schematic one more time, we can see that we've got uh, pin 5 with 220 volts and uh, the negative part of the power supply actually doesn't go to ground it goes to the negative 30 volt bias terminal so the negative 30 volt bias terminal represents the the negative part of the high voltage supply so we're going to be putting the high voltage between pin 5 and pin 8 Okay, and uh, if we look at where we're connected here, we've got pin 5 with the red lead, pin 8 with the black lead. I've got it going over to a bench supply, and I have the bench supply set for 22 volts. So instead of 220 volts, we're setting the bench supply for 22 volts. It's 10 times lower. So we're going to pretend that 22 volts is 220 volts. This is a very safe way of testing the high voltage circuits in the receiver to see if things are wired right. So going back to our schematic, we know that most of these tubes, pin 3 is the plate or the anode of the tube. And on pin 3, we should have the full voltage, the full 220 volts or in this case, 22 volts. So let me just start on one of the tube sockets. So the technique we're going to use is to look at all of the plates of the tubes, and those fortunately are all uh, pin 3, and the screens of the tubes, and they're all pin 4. I'm talking about the pentodes now, and the uh, and the frequency changer tube. So let's look at the first tube. We'll look at uh, the RF amplifier, pin one, two, three. And we have 21.8 volts or 218 volts. Okay. 
pin 4, we're going to have the screen. 9.3, and that would be 93 volts. Now we'll go to the frequency changer. 1, 2, 3. 218 volts. And pin 4, 95 volts on that voltage divider. Okay, now we're going to the, uh, the first IF stage. 1, 2, 3. 218 volts. And the screen. 92 volts or 9.2 volts. And on to the second IF, 1, 2, 3, 218 volts, pin 4, 94.3 volts. So you get the idea. So the second video, we didn't quite get as far along in the receiver as I thought we were going to, but uh, it turned out we had to do quite a bit more work with the wiring and the uh, capacitors than I would planned on. Uh, we did investigate uh, the biasing arrangement on the receiver and we're pretty certain that we're not going to see any smoke when we apply power to the receiver. In the next video we're going to actually build a power supply with a speaker inside that will match the receiver and we're going to uh, try to get the thing uh, basically functional. We've got to get some tube shields involved and uh, I think this uh, this receiver is going to start to make some noise next time you see it. The Führer has the balcony verlassen and betreten nun 